All right, so continuing with the series on the characteristics of God, we're going to look at another characteristic that I think a lot of people uh, today probably have no idea that is a characteristic of God. If you look down at verse number 14, where we started reading in Exodus 34, look what the Bible says in verse 14, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Today's society looks at the word jealousy or jealous, and you talk about someone being a jealous husband or a jealous wife. That's something that's really looked down upon and frowned upon, and people are ridiculed or made fun of, or just, you know, I can't believe, oh man, your husband is jealous, your wife is jealous like that. Come on, what's the big deal, right? People look down at the word jealousy as if it's just some bad thing. And if you were to tell these people, you know, did you know that God is jealous? They'd be like, no way, God's not jealous. Not the God that I serve, my God's not. Because they look at jealousy and they say, oh, what are you, insecure? Or, oh, don't you, don't you trust me? Right? And honestly, the Bible talks about jealousy and it talks about God. I mean, if, if God wasn't jealous, do you think he would say, whose name is jealous? You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses want to talk about, well, do you know the name of God? I think next time I'm going to say, yeah, jealous. Because <laughs> you know? they want to say Jehovah. It starts with a J, but it's a, it's a different name, right? Obviously, God's making a point when he says, whose name is, jeal whose name is jealous is a jealous God. He's saying, don't, don't misunderstand that God is a jealous God and, and so jealous, in fact, that you might as well just call me jealous. So, Looking at this, we need to understand, well, what is, what is the Bible talking about? Why is he a jealous God? Flip back, if you would, to um, Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to read for you a few, a few passages just further confirming, as if that one passage isn't strong enough, right? Saying, my name is jealous. Deuteronomy 4.24, the Bible reads, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Deuteronomy 5, 9 reads, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of thy fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And then again in Joshua 24, verse 19, the Bible reads, And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Now that's an interesting passage just by itself, especially when you just kind of pluck it out of context and just read it. Say, well, what do you mean he's not going to forgive our, your, your transgressions or your sins? I thought God forgives and God, he does forgive. But Joshua is talking to that people. He's talking to the children of the people whose, whose parents had to wander around in the wilderness all those years before they could go in the promised land because of their stiff neck and rebellion and just not serving the Lord. And basically he's just rebuking the people going, oh, you think you could serve this God? You know, did you know that God's a jealous God? You know that if you just go and start worshiping other gods and, and, and just turn your back on God, that God's going to be angry with you? Because every time you see jealousy in scripture, it's going to be tied with his anger because it makes someone angry. When someone be, you know, becomes jealous, you know, there's a reason for it. And then that reason is going to prompt anger. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit too. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I had you turn to Exodus chapter 20. So in the, the reference I read for you for Joshua, he's just warning the people, you know, God's holy and he's also jealous. So before, because he was kind of bringing to a point be like, you know, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. And he's just saying like, it's up to you to decide. Are you going to follow the Lord or, or not? You're going to follow the, the gods of the land of the heathen. Hey, if you choose to follow the Lord, just understand this. You better know that God's a jealous God. That if you choose to follow the Lord, it's the Lord only. You don't go and, and start mixing in all these pagan gods with the Lord. He's saying you just worship God. He's a jealous God. He doesn't want any other gods with him or, or you know, beside him. There is no other God. And definitely not before him. In, uh, in Exodus chapter 20, though, is the Ten Commandments which is going to help explain the jealousy of God. We understand pretty easily the jealousy of man where usually it's, it's a couple, you know, typically a married couple, where, 
you know, a husband might be jealous of a wife if another guy is like talking to her and, and starting to get too close and be buddy buddy and say, hey, well, wait a minute, what's going on there? Right. And why and why do you get jealous? Because your wife belongs to you. You say, hey, that's my wife. Don't you go talk into my wife like that and start to become real close buds with my wife. That's my wife. She belongs to me. I belong to her. And you have nothing to do with this, with this relationship at all. So you could, you know, this is an A and B conversation. You could see your way out. And that's the way, that's the way it ought to work. And you know what? I think that our society would be way better if people had a little bit of jealousy in their relationships because that shows you the, the, the reason why you have the jealousy is because you love your spouse. You love that person. You don't want anyone else coming in between and screwing up that relationship. I don't want some other guy coming in and trying to, to win over my wife's heart or, or try to do anything that's going to cause conflict in our relationship. I don't want that at all. And she doesn't want that either. And God similarly doesn't want anyone coming between us and him with our relationship with God. And God says, I'm a jealous God. I want you all to myself. And that's what, that's what the jealousy means here. I, I'm jealous. I want my wife all to myself. I, sorry, I don't want to share her, guys. Yeah, how crazy. What a crazy thought. But people today would think like, oh man, you're so uptight. Or what, you know, what's the big deal? In, in this wicked adulterous generation people have such a you know it's it's yeah but i know that the divorce rate is over 50 percent, and i know that there's all this adultery being committed but come on man you think that's the real problem yeah yeah actually i do I, I think that is a problem i think i think husbands are allowing their wives to get way too close with other guys and wives are allowing their husbands to get way too close with other women and it's just a breeding ground for adultery so no, sorry, I am going to be jealous over my wife because I want her to myself. And that is not a bad attribute to have, by the way. We're looking at the characteristics of God today. Look at Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And God spake all these words, saying, and, and I love that about Exodus chapter 20 here, God spake these words. There's no doubt about what God said. He said, These are the words that God spake. Verse number two, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Why? Why can't we make any gods? Why can't we make any idols? Why can't we bow down and worship this, you know, whatever statue or figure that we make up to represent God? Why can't we do that, God? For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. He just comes around and says, you know what? I'm jealous. I'm a jealous God. And he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy in the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. He says, I'm jealous. What does that mean? He wants you to himself. He wants the praise. He wants the glory. He wants the recognition. He wants the honor. And you know what? He deserves it all. He's the one that made us. He's the one that loved us enough to bring us salvation. He's the one that did everything for us. So he alone deserves the glory and the credit and the honor that only a God can receive. He says, don't make up any other gods. Imagine how angry he must be. He's the one who brought the children of Israel forth out of Egypt. And then when Aaron makes those, the golden calf, right? And oh, these be thy gods. And God's like, it's some metal, a clump of metal that came out of a fire. God specifically took the time to show his mighty hand and bring them out with a strong arm. And, and all the plagues and all the miracles and all the wonders and you're going to go and attribute all of that to a rock, to a, to a piece of metal, to junk. And you're going to call that a God? That's a slap in the face to God who says, no, don't be bowing down to that thing. You bow down to me. 
you bow down where, where you deserve to bow, where you're supposed to be bowing down to, and recognize your true heavenly Father. Look at um, basically the same thing in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We have a, a kind of a repeat of the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 6.13 the Bible reads, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. It's a warning. Don't go after any other gods because God is a jealous God. We want to understand who God is. God doesn't like you jumping around and hopping from God to God to God and then going to the Lord and saying, oh, well, no, I'm going to try this other God now. He says, no. He, first of all, he's the only God, the only true God. All these other gods are just devils. But he wants, he wants your attention, your affection, everything dedicated to him and him alone. He doesn't want to share you with anyone else, with any devil, with any stone or rock at all and if you and, and if he doesn't get that it makes him angry and for very good reason very good reason now flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 13 and again this this looking at jealousy as a as a bad trait a bad characteristic is indicative of of this permissive culture that we live in. Permissive, permitting whatever, everything, all manner of sin, abomination. That's why we see the, the coexist bumper stickers, right? On all the cars. Oh, can we just all get along? And, you know, I, and people just, just boast when you go to the doors, well, I respect all religions. You know, and, and they act like they're gonna do you a favor by not, you know, chewing you out or something. You say, well, I respect all religions. And then kind of like, like, and you should too. No, I don't respect all religions. I don't respect devils. I don't respect these satanic religions that, that set up these false gods. I have no respect for that whatsoever. And you know, I don't think God wants me respecting these, these religions and doctrines of devils that are sending people to hell. I think he wants us worshiping him. In fact, when we look at Deuteronomy chapter number 13, we'll get God's take on it in his law on how he feels about people coexisting and saying, hey, let's, let's go worship some other God. Oh, yeah, I know you're a Christian. Why don't you come over here, though, and, and come into our temple and come into to, to our synagogue of Satan and, and come worship over here and see how God dealt with that according to his law. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 13, verse number one. The Bible says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul. So what he's saying here is, if you get some guy coming along claiming to be a prophet, and he makes some prophecy, and it actually comes to pass, and the reason why he's bringing this up is because he's he's also given us, hey, if someone makes a prophecy and it doesn't come to pass, you know 100% for sure that's not from God, because the only prophecies that are going to come true, you know, any prophecy from God is going to come to pass. Because God doesn't go back on his word. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't tell lies, right? So, so the number one surefire way to know if someone is just a total liar saying, oh, I got this word from the Lord and the Lord's going to do this and the Lord's going to do that and it doesn't happen, you don't have to listen to that guy. He's a false prophet. But just because someone says something or makes a prediction, makes some type of prophecy that actually comes to pass, that doesn't automatically guarantee that they're of the Lord. He's saying even if you see like a sign or a wonder, you cannot just say, oh, well, this just must be from God then. 
You have to listen to the content of what they're saying. And this is what he says, you know, even in the last days, we're going to see this. Anyone who's alive and is remaining for when the false Christ and the Antichrist arrive, the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to deceive the people with what? Lying signs and wonders. Lying signs and wonders. He's going to use wonders to, to get people to go, wow, this must be God. But what's he going to be preaching? Another God. He's going to be leading people. Away. He's not going to be preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be teaching and preaching another God. And that's what God is warning people here. And he's saying, you know what? Even if you see people that come to you showing signs and wonders, he says, I'm just doing this to prove you. It's to test you just to make sure. Yeah, they said something that came to pass, but they're telling you to go serve other gods. So now I'm going to know what's in your heart. Are you really going to believe in me still? Are you, going to, are you going to stick with it and stick with my words and stick with the Lord? Or are you just going to allow your eyes to just be taken by some wonder that, that some charlatan comes and, and performs that's going to take your heart away to go serve after some other God and go whoring around with a different God? And he says the only reason he even allows that to happen is just as a test, just to see can you stick with it? Are you true? Is your faith true? Or are you just going to go with, with the wind and, and go with whatever looks good? And this is what I think, you know, a lot of the people in the, in the Pentecostal type movement, they're just looking for these signs and wonders and all oh, this speaking in tongues and this healing and all this other stuff. It's just, they're just drawn to that type of a thing. But what actually is being spoken is just heretical and lies and blasphemous and just against the word of God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three says, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So part of God's law is if you got people trying to draw you away from the Lord, the Lord that brought you out of Egypt, the Lord your God, the Lord who did everything for you, the Lord who's given you these commandments, if someone's coming to draw you away from that, and you've got this prophet, this false prophet that comes in, he says, you know what you do with that guy? He gets put to death. Now, why, why, oh man, that doesn't sound very religiously tolerant, does it? That doesn't sound like you respect that guy's religion. No, not at all. Right. No, there is no tolerance for the guy that's going to lead people to hell, just bringing in some other gods Amen. and destroy souls and destroy lives with his lies. No, not going to happen. And you say, well, it's not very American. I don't care. Right. I don't care. It's very biblical. That's what I care about. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. If thy brother, this is, this is how serious this is. If thy brother, the son of thy mother or thy son or thy daughter or thy wife of thy bosom or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly saying, let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely, as of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death and afterwards the hand of all the people. You want to talk about a serious commandment. That's a serious commandment. And he's, God is so serious about this. You don't see this, this level of, of detail on the offender when it comes to the rapist, when it comes to the murderer, when it comes, you know, when it comes to the sodomite, it doesn't say, hey, if it's a member of your family, you still, you still are supposed to, you know, give, give this punishment, this judgment upon them. 
But in this situation, when it comes to people drawing people away from the Lord, he says, if it's your own son, if it's your own daughter, if it's your own wife, your loyalty stays with God. That's how, I mean, look, you could take it on yourself and say, what would you do in that situation if it was your own wife, if it was your own son? But this is what God's telling you to do. And there's a lot of people that probably wouldn't have the loyalty to God enough to follow through with this, but this is what God is demanding. This is what he said. God's a jealous God. And he wants to keep it. He wants to keep his people to himself. And it doesn't matter to God who it is that's going to come along and try to steer you away and entice you away into whoredom with some other God. He says no. And I don't care how close they are to you. You do not listen. In fact, you get, that, you get rid of that leaven and that wickedness. And this is how you do it. Another important attribute of God to understand. Okay, this is scripture. This is the word of God. This might not sit well with you, and I understand that. You might not have ever even heard this before, and you could have been going to church your entire life. But you know what? This needs to be preached along with every other thing that's just gone by the wayside and has been forgotten because this is the word of God, and we need to understand who God is, and we need to make sure that we're right with God. Now, I'm not saying to take the law in our own hands and start killing, so don't take this the wrong way, okay? That's not the purpose of this. It's a purpose to understand who God is. We are not under the same laws that God has given unto his people when, with the children of Israel. We're not. So we can't just go around and start taking the law in our own hands because God has given authority to government, not just the individuals, to human government to do the punishment of evildoers. Okay, and that this, all of this would need to be done rightfully, not for right now. We don't have this system set up. But this is the way that God felt about it, and this is the way that God feels about it. He didn't change his mind. He's, no, he's not no longer a jealous God. He's not like okay with it anymore if your family member wants to go and, and say, hey, come, let, let's go follow Allah. Let's go follow Muhammad. Let's go follow Buddha. Let's go follow, you know, Krishna. Let's go follow any of these other fake false gods that damn people to hell. Let's go follow one of these gods. No, God feels the same way about it as he always has. coexist but you have Christians that just want to tout the same exact mindset just this new world garbage oh everything's good there's many ways to heaven yeah right you lying devil turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 6 Proverbs chapter 6 we're going to see, now, and it's, I don't even think you really need to see this. I think anybody can understand the concept. But to help us to get the right idea of how angry God gets with his jealousy over people going to other gods, we could liken it to your own relationship with your spouse. And when somebody, you know, if there's an adulterous relationship or affair or something, and the jealousy and the anger that you would get over someone committing that, you know, that, that level of betrayal, of just taking your, your total intimate trust and confidence and then just going around and just completely turning on its head and rejecting that and going and being with another person is, I mean, that, for one, the Bible has a death penalty on adultery not tolerated and for good reason because that is that is one of the worst things that I believe a person can do is to go and commit adultery against their spouse it's horrible it's a terrible thing to do and the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 6 the anger 
that someone gets in a situation like that. Look at verse number... Um, let's start reading in verse 27. Proverbs 6, verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committed adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man. He's comparing adultery with stealing. Someone steals bread. You know, the person who, get, who, it, who has been robbed, you might, you're going to be angry about that, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant feeling to be, to be stolen from and have someone kind of disrespect you and steal your stuff. But you know what? When they pay you back sevenfold, you say, all right, fine, right? You're not going to be like holding this, or you shouldn't be at least, holding this grudge. You can say, okay, it's fair. It's, you know, I, I was without for a while to deal with all this stress and stuff, but he paid me back seven times, so that kind of covers it. it, it the, the, the scale's been balanced, right? But when someone goes and lies with your wife, There's, there's no payback on that. There is, there is no going and making that, okay, oh, well, hey, how about if I just give you like a million dollars? No, sorry. That's not, that is not going to satisfy my mind. That's not going to appease the, the, the justice that needs to be served for you laying my, with my wife and committing adultery. But this jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom. Neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Nothing's going to satisfy him. The only thing that's going to satisfy him is the appropriate punishment that God has set forward, which is the death penalty. Yeah. So that's it. It's not hard to understand this either. Especially if you love your spouse. You don't want to think about anybody being with that person and you, you would want to kill that person that, that entered into that relationship and commit adultery. This is how God feels when his people start going after other gods. We are supposed to be dedicated only to him. He is, you know, in, in a sense, in one sense, our husband, right? The, the, we're the, the church is the bride and, and the Lord is the husband. And you can look at it that way. And um, turn, if you would, to Zephaniah chapter 1, because we're going to make this very clear connection between Proverbs 6 with, with, a, with a man and the same type of relationship with God. Zephaniah chapter number one. It's right near the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah one Verse number 18, the Bible reads, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured for the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So what this is saying here, when God is jealous, when his jealousy, when, when his anger is spurred on by his jealousy, that neither silver nor gold is going to be able to deliver them. There is no satisfying, there's no payment that can be made to appease God's wrath or his fury when his jealousy is, is sparked and triggered. And what triggers God's jealousy? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image or bow down to them. Those are the things that, that spurs God's jealousy because we are supposed to be to him only. Flip back, if you would, to um, Deuteronomy chapter 29. Oh, 
before we look at verses 18 through 20. Deuteronomy 29, look at verse number 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And it come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. This is talking about that false prophet that comes in. He says, lest there be among you a man, woman, family, tribe, whatever, whose heart turneth away from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. And this same person then going and saying, when he heareth the words of the curse, he hears the Bible, he hears the commandment of God, he hears the law, and he says, he blesses himself in his heart. Well, I'm going to have peace. And I'm just going to keep on doing what I want to do. I'm going to keep, I'm just going to go and just serve this other God. I don't care what that book says. I don't care what God's law says. And God says, I'm not going to spare. This morning we saw the mercy of God and the long suffering. But you know what? This is an example of a point where God's not going to show mercy because he said he's going to blot out his name from under heaven. He said, I'm going to wipe you out. This is one of those areas you don't want to go messing around with God's anger and his fury. And you know what does that? When you start going after other gods. That, that is, don't go there. <laughs> idolatry. It, it's, going after God's idolatry is literally what brings on the judgment of God. That, that triggers God's anger and it's caused by his jealousy because he wants you to himself. The children of Israel have done all kinds of various sins, but when they start just forsaking God and going after other gods, that's when God bring the brings the judgment. In Romans chapter 1, what is it that makes a person end up going reprobate? It's when they knew God and they glorify him not as God, become vain in their own imaginations, and they start making their own idols, and they go after idolatry, and they make up gods in their own heart, and they have a form of of God. They have a form of religion. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And they just make up their own gods. And then God gives them over to a reprobate mind. That's how nations become reprobate when they start going after the other gods. And that's how people become reprobate when they go after and make up their own gods. And that's it. There's no coming back from that. So look, God's jealousy is no joke. This is, this is very serious and very inherent to who God is. Something that nobody needs to forget. And you know what? People need to be warned about this too. Right. Believers and unbelievers alike. We need to be warned. Flip, back, flip over to Ezekiel chapter 23. Ezekiel 23. We're going to start reading verse number 22. It's one last portion of Scripture here. We're just going to see again the way that God feels about people who go after other gods and just kind of the, the, the wrath and the fury that's incurred through his jealousy. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Therefore, O Ahalabah, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated. And I will bring them against thee on every side, the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekot and Shoah and Koah, and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. And they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons and wheels, and with an assembly of people which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments." And I will set my jealousy against thee, 
and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy nose and thine ears, and thy remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by the fire. Now, these are all people that Jerusalem has gone after. They've gone after the Chaldeans, and, you know, and they start worshiping their gods, and they start forsaking the Lord. And he says, you know what, I'm going to bring all these people that you went after back on you to destroy you. And he says, in my jealousy against thee, they're going to deal furiously. They're going to be furious in their uh, destruction of you. And he, he, he goes on here, continuing verse number 26, they shall also strip thee out of thy clothes and take away thy fair jewels. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee in thy whoredom brought from the land of Egypt so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them nor remember Egypt any more. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will deliver thee into the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hand of them from whom thy mind is alienated. And they shall deal with thee hatefully and shall take away all thy labor and shall leave thee naked and bare and the nakedness of thy whoredom shall be discovered, both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. I will do these things unto thee because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen and because thou art polluted with their idols. The cause for all of this destruction coming upon them is because, why? God's saying they played the whore. They went around and were having these affairs with idols. They were setting their heart on the gods of the people of the heathen. And God said, well, because all of that, now I'm going to do all of this to you. Verse 31, thou hast walked in the way of thy sister. Therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. Thus saith the Lord God, thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup deep and large. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It containeth much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, and thou shalt break the sherds thereof and pluck off thine own breasts. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me and cast me behind thy back, therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. Flip over to Numbers chapter number 5. It's the last place we'll look tonight. Numbers chapter 5. Even as a nation, I don't care how much strength and military might the United States of America has in this perceived safety by our technological advances and all of our military and all of our missiles and all of this. When the United States starts going after other gods, you better be just 100% sure that God will not tolerate that for a minute. And you know what? It's already been happening. You see this, this integration now of Islam into just the, the country as a whole. And just this, this bringing in these false religions and just completely rejecting Christianity at all levels. I mean... I, I don't even need, we don't even need to argue about like, oh, well, these people aren't even saved anyways. Look, even just on the surface level, God cares about, you know, is the country as a whole considered a Christian, you know, nation? I mean, is this a nation that, yeah, of course, in government, you're going to have people who aren't saved and with some wicked people and whatever, and there's always going to be some wickedness around, but is the, the society as a whole, is the nation as a whole going, you know, known as Christians, as believers, as people who believe the Bible, or not. And when you start removing God's word, you start removing the Ten Commandments, you start removing all of the things that point to God and to God's law, and then start adding in all this other junk and nonsense and these false gods and this false religion, God's going to be like, you know, I blessed you because of all the good that was being done, because of the direction that you were taken. Now... I'm going to spew you out of my mouth and I'm going to bring doom and destruction upon you because you can't even, you're not even, you're not even going after the Lord. 
Not even, not even giving lip service to the Lord. And nowadays, I mean, things are, are, seem to be changing so fast that there's vitriol against the Bible and against Christians in this country. Now, it's always been that way in various countries and other parts of the world. People have always hated Christians in, in, you know, for different times, different places. But here, for a long time, it wasn't like that. By and large, right? Just, just kind of universal. There's been a lot more Christian practices that have been accepted here. I realize that, that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but that level of persecution is going to vary depending on where you're at and what's allowed in the country. And we've had it very good here for a long time, but things are shifting very rapidly, and God will bring his destruction on any nation that just, especially those that were his people and now are turning their backs and going towards other gods and idols and, and heathen religions. This is, a, this is a really serious message, a serious warning that people need to just take heed to. What are we going to allow in our country? What are we going to have to just tolerate everything? I don't think so. Push for tolerance is going gonna, is gonna to get you in the toilet. Numbers chapter 5, we're going to close on this. Since we're dealing with jealousy, we covered the characteristic of God, but God has also instituted in the Old Testament law how to deal with a situation where you have a husband who's jealous about his wife and thinks that his wife might have been unfaithful to him. And there's actually a whole, a whole portion, almost, almost an entire chapter dedicated to this, which that's, that's quite a bit of God's word that we're going to see, and we're going to see how God deals with this. Now, it feels about this, so we're going to see that, you know, the man that's jealous is not looked down upon. He's not shamed. There's nothing wrong with the jealousy itself. The problem is with the sin, not with the man who wants his wife only to himself. And we're going to look through this just, just to, to study a little bit and, you know, again, to help get our minds right and straight. And, you know, husbands or wife, if you, if you have your spouse that you feel like, man, I don't know why he's so jealous and I don't know why, you know, it's not a bad thing. Would you rather have a spouse that really just doesn't care what type of relationships you're forming and isn't looking out for you and isn't trying to keep your marriage, your relationship together by, by keeping you only to him. I mean, is it really that bad to say, well, my husband really cares about me and doesn't want to have any other relationships going on and understands that Adultery will not happen, way less likely to happen if you're not forming these relationships and starting to get more and more intimate with, with people of the opposite gender and, and you know, building these friendships. Even if they start off innocent, the closer you get to someone and you start having actual feelings for that person, as soon as things start going bad in your marriage and your relationship, that opens up the door wider and wider and wider for infidelity. And we need to be on guard against that, especially in the wicked generation we live in. Because there are tons of people who don't care at all about marriage out there. And that will be real quick to jump in and just say, oh, well, I love this person, so I'm just going to act on it. Because there is no more respect for marriage these days. Because no one has respect. Because people treat it as boyfriend, girlfriend, and not as a, a lifelong vow. It's completely lost its meaning in the society that we live in. So let's look at what the Bible says on how to deal with these situations. Look at verse number 11 of, of Numbers chapter 5. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, Neither should she be taken with the manner. 
and the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife and she be defiled or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife and she be not defiled so he's you know the bible is bringing up the situation and saying you know if there's a situation and a woman commits adultery against her husband and there was no one around to see this there was nobody there they weren't caught in the act and and you don't know that it happened but you know oftentimes based on your relationship at home you can start to have all these you know these questions rising up and you start to become more suspicious he says a spirit of jealousy come upon a man because hey things aren't adding up my wife seems to be talking quite a bit about this guy and coming up with these situations when I'm gone and, and, you know, I'm seeing some clues left behind and I can't prove anything, but something doesn't seem right here. And when you start having that jealousy of, of you know, not knowing and, and suspecting your wife of, of having this problem, that will affect your relationship and it's something that's going to need to be dealt with. And God had a way of dealing with this very situation, which is actually pretty incredible and just in and of itself the way that God deals with this. And I think this is really cool to, that he had this as part of his law to be able to just kind of settle this matter and be able to move on from it because he's able to bring this to a head and just, just deal with it instead of continuing all of this uh, you know, uh, suspicion. So he says, whether she actually did it or not, here's what we do. And, here, and here's how you go about dealing with this. Verse 15, Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her. The tenth part of an ephah of barley meal, he shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon. For it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near, and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head. And this, you can trace this back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Also, uncovering the woman's head, he's, he's shaving her head, which is already going to be a shame on her. Just having, even just, just bringing to this situation of, of having to go before the priest because her husband's suspecting her of, of being um, not unfaithful in their marriage. She gets her head shaven, it says, and then put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causes the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause a woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse, and the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar and afterward shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thighs shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed." This is the law of jealousies when a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him and he be jealous over his wife and shall set the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity and this woman shall bear her iniquity. 
One of the things I want to point out, so obviously there's a lot of things going on here. They're taking the water and putting a little bit of dust from the ground in there, and she's drinking it. And basically, if she was unfaithful, then God's going to make her, her belly to swell and her thigh to rot. And it's just going to be known, yeah, she was unfaithful. And if she wasn't, then God's going to bless her so that she's able to conceive, that she conceived seed and is able to have a, a child then. And this whole, obviously, this whole situation is not a, not a good one. It's not something you really want to be getting into, uh, which I think obviously would be, I don't think people would just be real quick to do this. But if it's really, you know, if someone's really suspecting, really serious about it, right off the bat, there's obviously some shame that goes into that because a woman has to shave her head. And then, um, but then on the woman's side, she ends up getting blessed if she, if she was faithful still, even though she has to suffer the shame of having her head, you know, shaven, that God will give her, uh, God will allow her to conceive seed and to have children. But I, the, the whole point I, I kind of spend, instead of going into all the detail on this, is the fact that there is no, like, nothing said ill about the man who's jealous over his wife at all. God makes a provision for the person who's jealous and says in the, in the last verse, then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity. There's no sin in the guy that's, that's jealous over his wife and, and says, no, we need to figure this out. I want to straighten this out and make sure that my wife's been faithful. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no iniquity in his hand. There's no sin. It's not a sin to be jealous and, and, and wanting your wife only to yourself because God is the same way. God wants you to himself. And, and we need to remember that and not just start, um, and, you know, and, and we'll never be, be joining hands and joining forces with, with all these other religions of the world or giving any respect to. I had someone write an email to me about uh, the, one of the sermons I preach on vaccines. And he was a Muslim. He says, like, you know, I really want to share this video, but you say, and I don't even remember what I said. I said something. Apparently, I said something about Islam. And, and this guy got offended by it. And he's like, if you could just take that out. And you, I'm like, no, I'm not going to take that out. Like, that's actually, you know what? Thank God. I'm glad he heard that. Because he needs to hear. It's not that I hate this guy, but you know what? I'm not going to go and start removing and editing God's word to just be able to fit with, with all religions. Well, I'm not trying to promote you know, Islam. I'm going to condemn it every opportunity I can along with every other false religion of the world because they're damning people to hell. And I don't care if this guy is right about vaccines and he ends up dying and going to hell because he's following some false god. I'd rather him shoot up all of his children <laughs> with, with the vaccines but actually be saved and serve the Lord. That's way better. All that to say jealousy is not a bad thing. It's not. And being jealous over your spouse doesn't mean you just, you know, I, I, it's not that I don't trust my wife. I trust my wife. And she trusts me. But we both want to be on guard against the relationship that we've built and that we have together. So we're going we're gonna to have rules in place that, yeah, they're going to be based on jealousy because we want each other only to ourselves. So we're going to have rules that are going to separate us and keep us from having relationships. That's why even me as a pastor, I don't counsel women just one-on-one. -on -one. Me and a woman. It's never going to happen. Ever. My wife is always going to be present or some other, there's always going to be someone around to keep things, you know, on the up and up. And that there is absolutely, and you know what? I don't, it's not that I think that any woman wants to have some relationship with her. It doesn't matter. This just completely removes any opportunity for anything like that ever to happen. And it doesn't matter what the situation is. You know, if you have people at work, you know, men, there's, there's, there's a lot of women in the workforce now. Don't go making buddy-buddy with the women at work. If you're married, you don't need that relationship. Keep everything just... You know, don't, don't even allow that, those bonds to form. 
You may not even be thinking about adultery now, but who knows? You don't want to let these, these relationships build to a, to a, um, to a level that's, that's going to provoke jealousy and, and not end up being good for your relationship. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We, we, um, thank you so much for being a jealous God, that, that you care about us and, and love us deeply, that you don't want us being uh, turned about to any other gods. And Lord, um, we want to follow you. I pray that you please help us in the, the day and age that we live in now where people want to take biblical principles and turn them on their head. Lord, help us not to be uh, carried away with the philosophies of this world, but that we can maintain a, a proper biblical perspective on, on your characteristics and, and how we ought to live. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.